Um, I, my name is Jay Kidd, and I'm a Senior Vice President in NetApp's Product Development Organization. And I'm joined today by uh, Vittorio Viorengo, uh, Vice President of End User Computing at VMware, and Ed Bunyan, the CTO and VP at Cisco's SAV uh, Business Unit. And about a year ago, uh, our three companies uh, announced a, a technical collaboration called Imagine Virtually Anything. And the goal of this collaboration was to bring together the technologies from our three companies and produce architectures and reference designs for the easy and simple deployment of uh, scalable virtualized infrastructure. And what we'd like to do in this session is share a bit of the principles and the philosophy that go into those reference designs and architectures, and also share some of the benefits that would accrue to you if you go through the, de the deployment and you embrace these architectures, and also give you a sense of where to find more information, how to get started, and where to go during the rest of the show to learn more about this. Uh, this is where it always surprises you. Next slide. <laughs> That, if that in my hand, right? Push the. We're going to be a little simpler. So, <coughs> right now, if you look at what enterprise IT is going through right now, they're under pressures probably worse than I've seen in my 30 years in the industry. Uh, you've got a user base that is. Is their expectations of what IT can do for them is highly elevated by the internet, by the self-empowerment that they feel, and plus they're dealing with compliance and regulatory requirements that are unlike anything we've seen before. You're living with infrastructure, which was probably deployed between three and five years ago. It doesn't have the agility that you're looking for to satisfy the new requirements of these, these users. It's not seeing the, the asset utilization that you'd like to see, and you're struggling with producing uh, or, or deploying data protection and recovery architectures that will support the, the constant uh, availability always on infrastructure that these, these users are looking for. So you're facing some real challenges. Um, now, when you face these challenges, you're looking to get more efficiency uh, out of your infrastructure. And there's typically three ways that IT professionals will look at to gain some efficiency uh, from, from a set of equipment. Uh, you can look at your people, you can look at your processes, and then you can actually look at the technology you've deployed. And these are dials you can turn to crank up the efficiency to get better return uh, for the money spent. Now, it turns out that when you look at people, uh, yes, you can lay people off, and that gives you short-term uh, OPEX, if operating expense efficiencies, but it really doesn't help you meet the service levels that these, uh, these users are expecting from you. So it's really not a good long-term solution. So aside from that, what you can do with the people you have is you can either train them, uh, you can get smarter people, or you can just work them harder. But no matter what, you're not going to get a tremendous amount of efficiency just by holding the whip a little tighter in a sweaty palm and driving them harder. It's going to take some other types of changes. Um, processes are the next things that people look for. Uh, can I optimize the way I do things? Can I save time? Can I become more responsive? Can I? Uh, uh, drive a level of efficiency into the process. And if you have fairly new technology, there often may be optimizations you can do to get more um, by using processes. But if you've been working with your equipment for a while, you've probably tuned it pretty well, your people and your processes are pretty well aligned, and you're not going to get tremendous efficiencies from the existing technology or the existing architectural approaches. So we believe that there's a set of technologies that have emerged now that we'll talk about that enable a transformation in uh, an application infrastructure uh, within IT. And that by transforming the technology, you can get significantly lower costs uh, in the operation. You can save on the maintenance costs of a lot of the legacy equipment, just save on the efficiency, the amount, the power, the, sp uh, the space, the cooling. Then if you align your people and your processes to really take advantage of the new capabilities of this virtualized infrastructure is when you really see uh, the benefits uh, now, the, the nature of this transition um, is a shift from a purchasing model and a deployment model for IT, where traditionally people have bought equipment based on a project for a particular application. I'm standing up Oracle. I'm standing up Exchange. I'll buy a server. I'll connect it to the network. I'll buy some storage. And I'll basically deploy architecture and infra infrastructure in silos specific to the application. And then these things cookie cutter out, and it's a traditional distributed budget model. And you end up with a 
rich diversity and a high complexity in the overall infrastructure. Now, the new model is to look at more at a, a horizontal approach uh, to, to IT infrastructure, really spurred and triggered by the maturity of virtual server technology from, from VMware. This enables, uh, this, this, uh, this approach is to build a pool of compute resources, a pool of, of virtualized storage resources, and to connect them all together uh, via network. This results in a much, more, much better asset utilization because you're sharing equipment across a much broader set of, of applications. And overall, a higher service level because the agility that this type of shared infrastructure can bring to more rapidly deploy applications is much more in line with what your users are expecting and what they perceive they can get from outsource alternatives on the internet. So the service-oriented service infrastructure is really where we see people going and where a lot of the technology you'll be uh, hearing about this week is applied. Now, there's some companies that have already gone through this transition. Uh, BT in the UK uh, went through a transition where they had a, an organically grown a weed garden of IT spread across eight locations or, uh, around, uh, around London. They went through and ripped out a whole lot of equipment. The picture on the right is the outgoing equipment being hauled away uh, to recycling yards. Picture on the left is the new highly virtualized modular server network and storage architecture that they deployed uh, to gain the efficiencies. And they actually kept track of the before and after picture. And so there's a compelling set of metrics around what they did. You know, they started with over 700 racks at eight different sites with some equipment that went back eight years. And they consolidated that down to about 40 racks at five sites. They still needed the sites for other reasons, but they significantly reduced the amount of equipment. From well over 3,000 servers to something uh, around 150 servers. Significant power savings by modernizing the equipment. Saved over $2 million a year in power. They cut the number of network ports by a factor of 10, simply by having less devices attached, less power cords, uh, less units to manage. But in addition to the, the equipment savings that were realized, they were also able to significantly improve the service level to the users for deployment of new applications. Time to provision an application went from uh, weeks to 12 minutes. And even officially, they say 24 hours because they might not be at the phone when it rings to, do, to provision the virtual machines. But they actually could get one stood up in a few minutes. This level of transformation is dramatic in an organization. And they were able to basically pay for the equipment and the, uh, the, basically the new deployment in about eight months through the savings realized uh, by taking out the old equipment. This is real ROI. This is budget savings within the, the budget year and a significant uh, return on investment. Now, what BT went through and what we see a lot of customers going through now is a journey. Uh, there is a transformation going on, but it's not all done in one step. You may not leap from siloed architectures to a fully deployed internal or external cloud model. There's a few steps along the way toward optimizing your IT, transforming your, your equipment, and then uh, bringing the people and the process up to date to work with it. So we've seen a lot of companies move from the siloed architecture to what we've called zones of virtualization, where there may be some benefits accruing from sharing equipment, some improvement in uh, service level delivered in terms of deploying new applications. But largely, it still is within the organizational boundaries that existed with silos and within the other traditional models of, of operation. Then the next step is to move on to a truly shared infrastructure across a wide range of workloads. And that requires some shifts in behavior inside the organization where IT is offering literally a service level, not a set of equipment to the business users. And uh, business users are trusting IT to deliver on that. That's really where you get the, uh, the significant benefits in operating efficiency and asset utilization. But this is a journey. The technology to do this is real, it's mature, and there's thousands of customers all over the world who are moving along this journey. So what I'd like to do is turn it over to Vittorio uh, from VMware to tell you more about this journey. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, last year we spent a lot of time um, trying to figure out how this journey works. In, in, in instinctively, we knew that people were going through phases of virtualization and, and this evolution from you know, the silo approach to the share architecture and so on and so forth. Um, and so we hit the road and we talked to uh, 50, 60 customers, but not just, actually, we, mostly we listened. Uh, and we sat down and we asked them, when did you start? Uh, why? Uh, what were the obstacles? Uh, how did you over, 
uh, came, how did you overcome the obstacles, what came next, and so on and so forth. Um, and we came up with this um, journey framework that allows us to really help other customers that are maybe a little behind in their journey to kind of avoid the mistakes and, and, and use the best practices. Um, and one thing that we realized is that two years ago when Paul Maritz took over the company, uh, he started to talk about this cloud computing uh, transition. And even within VMware back then, we were growing great. You know, virtualization was everything we were doing and, and all that. A lot of people had the, uh, the puppy dog uh, look, like, huh? what? What, what is that? What, define it for me. What, what does it mean? Through the journey, what we realized is that when you look at the people that are, they've done the transformation. I talk to more and more customers this day that, that are 90% virtualized, 95% virtualized. They've done an, an, everything that they could. And when you talk to these customers, the way they talk about their IT is not how they build it and how they, they deliver it, but it's more how they consume it, how the business consume it, consumes it. You know, how they can get a service up and running overnight, just like you know, Jay just said. Um, how they can respond to change, how they can scale up and scale down. And so we started to look at the, those guys and say, these guys are operating a, a private cloud. And you know that now we're talking about pressure and um, the, the, anybody in IT can go behind the, sorry, anybody in the company can go behind the IT's back, f swipe their credit card, and get a server on EC2 for 10 cents an hour in five minutes. And so increasingly, the business is looking at IT and says, how come it takes eight weeks to, to provision a server? So then we, we, when we talk to those guys that are there, and they're living the dream. And then we talk to the guys that are more at the beginning of the journey, and they go, OK, got it, but how do I get there? Because I'm dealing with all these other things. You know, I, have, I have to keep my, my lights up and, uh, and on and, and so on and so forth. So the journey, this customer journey, is really the, the prescriptive, pragmatic way to get there. And the customer journey evol evolves along two main lines. Again, this, what I'm telling you now is all coming from customers. This is not VMware, VMware propaganda. What we found is that the journey evolves in three main stages, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And then it evolves along the adoption of technology. Just like Jay said, every time you adopt some of these additional capabilities in the technology, it creates that environment, then then you can go and virtualize the mission-critical uh, workload. Uh, later on, it, it, you deploy more uh, of, of, the, of things like uh, automated management uh, that go all the way from the, um, the application all the way to the storage infrastructure and the network, and then you can uh, increase your level of automation. I, I, we did a similar pitch to a set of customers a few months ago, and one customer told me something that stuck with me. He said uh, two things. One said, screwdrivers don't scale, which is a good one, right? You know, if you want to be able to scale up and scale down, you have to have the extra capacity and an infrastructure that allows you to do that. The other thing that this customer told me was that when you go from this silo approach to the shared infrastructure, the attitude that sometimes you get from the business is, I bought it, I might need it, why should I share it? Yeah. Uh, and so some, that also talks to some of the cultural issues that we are facing in IT as we move to, through this journey. But going back to the journey, three main stages, and then each stage is, is uh, uh, driven by uh, the adoption of additional technology that creates the right environment uh, for those workloads. So what are those uh, uh, stages? Um, the first stage, we call it IT production. And that's where it's the, in, the, in the beginning where IT virtualizes everything that they own. So you, st you install ESX, you try it out, you're like, wow, this stuff works. And then you start doing the stuff that you own, right? So that you don't have to ask for, uh, for permission. You do the file, the print, the, the, uh, the Citrix farms, uh, domain controller, and web servers, and, and that kind of stuff. And one of the biggest obstacles that we find in this uh, phase of the journey is uh, storage. You know, some customers, especially the smaller one, don't have the right storage infrastructure. And so in the beginning, it's important to sit down and, and get storage and network right. Uh, so when we, we talk to the customers that are st still struggling in that phase, where we tell them two, two things. One, train your people across disciplines. Because uh, one of the biggest obstacles is that the network guy doesn't talk to the server guys, doesn't talk to the storage guys, because for the most part, they don't really need to. But with, with virtualization, it, we cut across everything. And so you need to get, the, 
get them together. So when you ask this, the network guy to provide you with like 500 ports behind a set of blades, they understand what the heck you're doing there. Right? Uh, and the other one is get storage right and build an architecture that has room for growth. So that as you start growing, and you never say no to a virtual machine. And so you, can, you, you foster people going that way. The second stage of the journey, we call it business production. Because after you get to 25-30% virtual, virtualized server, you, you're, run, you're running out of things that you own. And you need to start dealing with business applications. And that's a big deal, because in the beginning you go, oh my god, if this goes down, I lose my job. You know, the, the, sometimes the business pushes back because they don't understand the value. And what we found there, the people step back, they start to deploy the, SR, the SRM, HA, FT, and some of the storage uh, and network redundancy solution from our partners. And now they're ready to go to the business and say, I'm going to virtualize your application because it's going to run better in the virtual environment. Uh, and when that starts to you know, happen, and then they, they go through the second phase Pretty, pretty well, and, and after a while, you see, I talked to a customer that was virtualizing an application that generates $40 billion a year. And I was new to the, to the to virtualization. It was in my first two months in the job I was doing this project, and I asked him, why? Because I, up until that point, I talked to customers in phase one, and I never heard something like that. And the guy looks at me, looks at me and goes, I'm virtualizing that application because as long as that application runs physical, I don't sleep tight. And, that, and back then, I didn't realize what that was. Later on, I realized that, that that is a customer that is in phase two, is comfortable with the technology, has deployed the right infrastructure, and is going for it. Then you hit another wall, or another inflection point uh, before stage three. Stage three, we call it resistance is futile. Whatever comes our way, we're going to virtualize it. Uh, and, and, but before you get to that, uh, point, that's where you have to stop and look at your processes and people and, and that side of things. Because um, we talk to customers where they, they deploy the server in 12 minutes, still takes them eight weeks to get it into production because of all the red tape that they have around the process. And so if they don't change that, you know, they, they, they're not going to be able to scale to, to 100% and start to get to that you know, agile environment that people achieve in, in the third stage. Now, in terms of distribution of the customers, of course, the majority of the, I would say today the majority of the customers are between stage one in pushing to stage two. Then there are many customers in stage two. They are virtualizing the exchange, the business, you know, business mission critical application, especially legacy applications where, you know, sometimes that if that server crashes, you don't even know how to rebuild that server. So as soon as you P2V it, you say, okay, now at least I know how to move that file around. Uh, and then there are some customers uh, in stage three. And those are the ones that, even big ones, we talk to customers with thousands of servers in stage three. Okay? But the idea is that we want to now use this to help more and more customers get to stage three faster using the experience from these guys. So one interesting thing about this journey that, that we learn is that at the beginning is all about cost savings. People virtualize because they go from pick your number, you pick your consolidation number. Instead of buying 10 servers, you buy one, blah, blah, and so on and so forth. So you get increased in better consolidation, better utilization, cost of, of computing goes down. Great. But around stage two, that's where the, the value proposition changes because in stage two, people, the, the reason why people virtualize um, applications is not necessarily for cost saving. It is to get a better environment uh, that has better business continuity and quality of service. And so when you start to do the, you know, implement those type of ca capabilities, you really start to add to the top line. You know, for example, I talked to a customer that um, used to do promotions. It's a um, car company. And used to, do, to make a promo uh, run a promotion, it would take them like six weeks to set the farm and set every, the, all the infrastructure that they needed to launch a new car. And now they do it over the weekend. And, and, uh, and sometimes they don't even realize that th what they're doing is not cutting costs, is adding to the top line because they're much more agile than their competitors. And that's all enabled by the virtualization stack and this, this cloud computing stack that we're, we are building with, uh, for them with our, uh, with our partners. So the journey, if you start to define cloud along this type of characteristics, pick your characteristic that you most like, but most people tend to converge to this, these ones. Abstraction, pooling, elasticity, service level, multi, uh, secure multi-tenancy, and so on and so forth. 
you can, we actually went back and looked at how customers have, uh, adopt our technology over time, and you can actually map the evolution of, of the, the journey and the skew that they deploy over time uh, to achieve those type of characteristics. The thing that people still do on their own, because the stack didn't have it built in, uh, was the, ser the service catalog, ser service, and pay by consumption, which is the top, the most, probably the most business-oriented features of cloud computing. Uh, and uh, this, at this conference, we're going to launch, um, oops, that's the old. we're going to launch, so people today, what they do, they, they, build, they build either a custom solution or they use some of this point solution. For example, how many of you use Lab Manager? A few people. So Lab Manager gives you that kind of environment for uh, test and dev, right? You have your you know, service portal, you know, your service, which is a service catalog, and, and, and so on and so forth. So at this conference, we, we're going to announce uh, vCloud Director, uh, formerly known as Redwood Project, which basically gives you this out of the box. And so through VMware has been driving this evolution to give you all the characteristics um, that achieve all the characteristics of cloud computing that people care about uh, through SKU that you can actually buy. Now, again, let's not discount the people and process aspect of it, but you know, from a stack perspective, you get it. And now in the remainder of the presentation, you'll see how the partner ecosystem provides the, the, all the critical pieces that you need around storage and network and, and the infrastructure so that you can move from stage one to stage two. Remember, moving from stage one to stage two requires you to have an infrastructure that has better business continuity, better quality of service for business applications because that's what the business cares about in that stage. Um, so with that, I want to pass the baton to uh, Ed, who's going to go into more details about the, the technology that we bring to bear as a, the three companies combined. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vittorio. So, so Jay talked about, um, you know, after the introduction, uh, Jay uh, and Vittorio talked about the, the, the situation that we're in, both from a process perspective, a technology perspective, and a people perspective, with respect to the journey to the cloud. What I'm going to do on behalf of the, the three companies working together is give you an overview of the solution that we've put together and that we've delivered. Um, the, the, there are a couple of sort of key principles in terms of the relationship that we have uh, between the three companies. One is we actually, you'll, you'll see, we have a very aligned common vision for um, a unified infrastructure. Unification and simplification at the underlying infrastructure level is fundamental to the deployment of a scalable virtual infrastructure. Uh, Vittorio said that screwdrivers don't scale, right? Obviously, if you think about a server at a time, it's obvious that the, the problem is not going to scale. If you think about a small ESX island and a, replica, a replication of independently managed ESX islands, this is you're still stuck with having screwdrivers in your data center. And the vision that we have as three companies is to get into, through a unified architecture, is to get to the position where you actually have a, an infrastructure that could be addressed at the scale of an entire uh, data center. And then, uh, just as three companies, we, we actually have a very easy way of working together because we all share the same uh, approaches to partnering, uh, to uh, conversations with customers, responding to customer requirements. So it's been a very, very effective relationship over the past year. The, um, the challenge that we set ourselves to address when we start working very close together about a year ago is really how you can actually go from a, 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 a taxonomy where you may actually be virtualizing, but you're virtualizing in independent islands where different groups own their own virtual infrastructure, compute, network, storage, and the VMware management level. To some play, to a, a position where you actually have true multi-tenancy at the underlying infrastructure. Nope. It's coming for me. I've got nothing.
Okay, can you hear me now? So the good news is... Ooh. Can you hear me now? So the good news is this only happens one per conference. And I have two other... So I'll try the joke again. So the good news is this only happens once per conference. And I have two more sp other speaking sessions this, this week. So now we have the, the technical issues taken out of. Take. So, so the, um, it's going back to the point that we're at. And, and the, the unique problem that we were trying to solve when we started on this a year ago is how to come up with a, through a unified architecture to a set of infrastructure solutions, products best in class working together that can deliver a solution that solves the secure multi-tenancy problem. Creating a foundation that gets different or operational teams comfortable using the same underlying resources. So it's not just about having the hypervisor layer allowing you to share resources and have different VMs to different organizations. It's looking at it from the perspective of network infrastructure, the compute infrastructure, and obviously importantly from the storage infrastructure as well. So the if you think about the key building blocks towards this, this unified end-to-end uh, -end architecture is the, obviously the, plat the compute platform of Cisco UCS, which combines network and computing into a single integrated system that's actually specifically designed for those types of multi-tenant de de deployments. And it's built around a converged fabric. And the benefit of the converged fabric is it can basically be used to connect to any particular storage device. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're using a block methodology or a file methodology. It doesn't matter, matter whether you're using an IP-based methodology or a fiber channel-based methodologies because the platform provides you ubiqu ubiquitous connectivity to all storage types. Um, and then obviously our partner NetApp in this has some specific capabilities that, and we'll talk about them, that are called the virtual filers, which provide the ability to take an array and carve it out and make it represent and, and appear as multiple independently managed storage arrays. So it's not, again, carving out a storage array to have multiple LUNs. It's carving out an array to get multiple virtual arrays. The same way with UCS, you can carve out a scalable piece of compute infrastructure and have it appear as different clusters with independent management units and independent network connectivity. You can do the same thing on the storage subsystem. And then, obviously, as part of, of the solution, there's one virtualization platform, and that's where the efforts start with, in, in all honesty, with, with vSphere 4 and moving into uh, 4.1 and, and the upcoming announcements. And this is an animated slide. So if you think about the building blocks of what we've, what we've qualified, what we've developed uh, as a solution together by taking our existing respective products, uh, leveraging the management capabilities of Virtual Center, uh, leveraging from a UCS manager perspective uh, the built-in single point of management capability for the network and the compute infrastructure. So that's basically is how you stand up ESX. Uh, and then from a storage perspective, uh, the virtualization of the, of the filers, but also the ability to manage the storage from a single pane of glass through plugins in Virtual Center. And this is really about providing if you're going to put a lot of eggs in one basket, you have to make sure that you've got security and availability that's effectively built in at every particular level. Um, and this is also where the, the three companies have solutions that, are, that, are that solve the, pr the same problem at different levels and are designed to work together. Uh, VMware Site Recovery Manager uh, provides you uh, an easy set of workflows and systems to provide uh, the ability to recover your virtual infrastructure on a remote site. Um, the data center interconnect strategy from Cisco is basically a set of network building blocks that simplify the management of the network as you go through these site recovery operations. As, as probably many of you who are site recovery customers understand, one of the main pain points today is the, the need to re-IP VMs and the need to manage the mapping tables between uh, the left IP addresses and the right IP addresses in the context uh, of a SRM operation. And DCI is 
a set of network-based solutions that provide you transparency at the network level uh, that are available either over dark fiber, and that's been available for a while, but now, and this is one of the recent announcements that we made at Cisco, also available over IP networks and a technology called OTV that provides you that level of transparency. And then obviously, if you want to have protection across sites, uh, the prerequisite that both of us, uh, Cisco and VMware, make is that uh, the storage has those replication capabilities, and that's where SnapMirror comes in. So protection is one thing. If you want to put a lot of eggs in the same basket, security is obviously the other. You have to get uh, the different uh, constituencies, and at the end of the day, the different budget owners to be comfortable pulling resources together. Uh, and this is where uh, the secure multi-tenancy comes in. This is where the ability to have virtual filers in the storage to effectively have independently managed pools of storage. The ability to have independent networks that are independently managed. We have a concept similar for our core routing platforms called VDCs, which allow you to have the same router or switch, data center switch be managed by different groups and appear as different devices. And then obviously within UCS itself, the ability to isolate different networks at layer two. Now, one of the, um, the interesting uh, side effects of an architecture that has that level of scalability and that level of protection and that level of built-in intrinsic multi-tenancy is that you, all, you, you do want to get to, the, to, to sort of maximize the benefits and to get to a, a set of options that actually simplify the provisioning and the management of that infrastructure at the physical layer, the layer below the VMware layer. And this is something where we have a, a very clear strategy of working together with a set of ecosystem partners. BMC and Dynamic Ops are two uh, ecosystem partners that work very closely with us. Um, and what they're basically doing is using the APIs of our own products the way they're intended to be used. So vSphere has a set of APIs. UCS has a set of APIs. as a comprehensive open API framework. And ONTAP has a set of programmatic APIs. And basically, our partners in the orchestration space leverage the APIs, use them as they're intended to be used in order to deliver an automation, an automation of the blueprint that we've developed as, as the three infrastructure companies. Very effective uh, set of solutions. A lot of interesting demos uh, at uh, this show uh, about precisely how you combine higher level source management orchestration with a virtualized, intrinsically multi-tenant infrastructure. And at the end of the day, um, this is about uh, agility. Right? We talk about elasticity a lot. Elasticity is absolutely fundamental. Um, it's actually going to change the way we think about the infrastructure. It's actually gonna also going to change uh, the business model, the way we think about buying physical infrastructure. And that's because in a traditional environment, you're used to rolling out new servers as physical building blocks that are discrete. They're purchased. They're laid out, even if they're going to be virtualized at the end. This is all changing because now we have a framework and a platform in which you can add capacity on demand, potentially through, in some level, through licensing for certain customers that have planned growth requirements. And effectively, you turn it on when you need it. And the ability to, to do end-to-end -end provisioning literally in minutes um, is absolutely fundamental. So for example, we have a, a, a solution that we're working together as three partners right now to facilitate the provisioning of ESX by relying on the ONTAP uh, flex coding capabilities. Think about that as the ability in just a few minutes to discover a new blade at UCS, the UCS manager, and then immediately associate with a particular through policy to a particular ESX image and a particular ESX data center and have the operation complete literally in minutes. So just to, to, to go a little bit at the next level of detail on, on the product that, that, Cisco, that is Cisco's main product in this particular offering, it's UCS. And, and you can sort of break it down into, into four big themes that we have pushed ever since we started thinking about the, the problem architecturally throughout the product development and now as we're managing through our roadmap. Uh, the first is really, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is the value and the importance of having an embedded management plane. The ability to effectively turn gear into a set of RESTful web services. Uh, we used to think of gear as gear. And again, that's fine in a classic physically managed uh, paradigm. 
as we move into the cloud, it's fundamental to be able to think about gear at a scalable level as a set of web services that allow you to control the gear itself. So the provisioning and the management is key. Uh, the focus on virtualization has been a, a big theme since the beginning. One of the things we did is we built a unified fabric designed for virtualization that drives a concept of virtual interfaces on an end-to-end -end basis all the way to an adapter, which is the Cisco VIC card. And the Cisco VIC card is one that gives you increased efficiency, and particularly for the most IO-intensive workloads. It also gives you increased isolation in the context of secure multi-tenancy because you can terminate VLANs in the fabric without ever having to trunk uh, to a software layer. The third pillar of UCS is that it's fundamentally a standards-based design. Everything that works on an x86 platform works on UCS. There, there are actually no exceptions that we know of. We support pretty much everything. You have a choice of operating systems, hypervisors, and solutions running on top of that. Uh, and we actually have done, uh, have a very clear strategy of being the best x86 platform, and we have a number of uh, benchmarks and, and leadership uh, um, results to, to prove it and back it up. And then the last point is, again, a lot of the, the IP in UCS is, is in two areas, on the management side and obviously in the unified fabric uh, that is a 10 gig ethernet based unified fabric connecting the system at scale. And so that's effectively is the, the visual impact. Uh, Jane, I think Jay mentioned the, uh, the importance in reducing the number of ports uh, and the importance, and obviously we sell ports at Cisco, so we think, we usually talk about the importance of reducing the number of cables, because we actually don't, well, we sell the cables too, but we don't really make a lot of money on them. Um, so it's really important, uh, no pun intended, to get into a model where the wiring of the physical data center can be rationalized. Uh, these are actual pictures. I've actually have seen much messier pictures of a traditional blade server architecture. What you see uh, on the right is the picture of UCS demonstrating the value from a deployment perspective of having a, a unified fabric of 10 gig. Um, again, to the theme of, of putting a lot of eggs in the same basket, needing protection, needing security, um, you also need visibility. Troubleshooting is absolutely paramount. Uh, Cisco uh, and network administrators are, are fundamentally responsible to troubleshoot networking issues on an end-to-end -end basis. And that is where the VNLink capability comes in, which is the collaboration we did with VMware that really provides you the ability to extend the network into the virtual infrastructure, giving full visibility to network administrators as to what's going on in a virtualized environment. It's about elimination what's otherwise an operational gap uh, in the network. Um, this is uh, foundational for a number of, of services above and beyond simply the layer two capability available in the Nexus 1000V, as well as in UCS in our hardware implementation of VNLink. We actually have uh, uh, an important announcement, so this is my plug for uh, the session where I will not have technical problems uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And it moves. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jay to talk about specifically on the storage side. With the infrastructure that we're talking about, we've given our apply to sort of server infrastructure. We will hear a lot this week about um, the technology and the, the, the emergence of technology for very large scale virtual desktop and, and user computing environments as well. Um, I won't give all the news away, but uh, come to the NetApp Super Session tomorrow at 3.30. We will be sharing some of the details on how we've, uh, we've tested and uh, written a, an architectural white paper around a 50,000 seat VDI implementation uh, using NetApp storage, uh, Cisco and a range of servers and VMware technology. So large scale VDI, the technology is becoming real. Now, Vittorio talked about the, the journey, some of the, the intersection of the technology uh, and virtualizing uh, servers with the business practices and, and IT principles. Ed talked about some of the, uh, the technologies within the network and with the servers. What I'd like to do is round out and talk about some of the capabilities that are required from storage to build these uh, large-scale virtualized infrastructures. Um, scalability is clearly one of the, the first requirements. This is an infrastructure which is intended to scale large, to support a large number of workloads and a large number of diverse workloads. 
So it must be able to scale along a number of dimensions. It must be able to offer the level of performance required for the, the more demanding workloads and then scale down to have less performance at lower cost for those workloads that, that don't require it. But the, it's all got to be within the same shared infrastructure. It's, you've got to be able to add performance where it's needed and then not have the cost of adding it where it's not needed. Similar for capacity. Now you want to be able to add capacity dynamically and be able to scale from a few terabytes of infrastructure up to petabytes of infrastructure uh, with a level of scale that's required in some of the larger customers. And then also extending these infrastructures over distance. Um, the, the whole purpose of shared infrastructure is to break out of the bonds of a single server rack or a single storage array or even a, a single um, organizational pod, but to extend that to the data center and then extend that to multiple data centers that may be separated over distance. The speed of light still applies, and there are some constraints, but the, the idea is to be able to have infrastructure which scales to multiple locations in as transparent a fashion as possible. Uh, and the, in addition to scalability, efficiency is an absolute requirement to gain the cost savings realized by going to the shared infrastructure. Um, at NetApp, we've, we've developed technologies which allow people to store more data in less spindles. And we even guarantee that you can store your VMware data in half the space of traditional legacy architectures. There's a number of technologies that contribute to storage efficiency. Um, there's the heavy uh, use of SATA disk, which is about th a third the cost of fiber channel disk, and well architected and well used with, uh, with caching can deliver the same performance in application level workloads. There's uh, thin provisioning technologies, the ability to have disk based, or, uh, and also the ability to have disk based data protection through the use of snapshots, but done in a way that does not adversely affect performance of the primary application. Deduplication, thin replication, virtual copies and clones, all of these are techniques for not storing data which is duplicated and already exists on disk. With a fundamentally virtualized storage architecture, there's no reason to store the same block of data twice. You can just change the metadata to point to that, uh, that single block. This results in less spindles being required, less overall capacity, and is far more efficient when technologies such as Flash are used for caching you can deduplicate the data within the cache as well and get much more benefit from a fairly expensive flash resource. So high efficiency uh, within the NetApp storage. We have hundreds of case studies where customers have moved from other storage to NetApp and their VMware data takes up about a quarter to a third of the space it was taking up before. So real, uh, real examples, real benefits. Now, you know, and also Ed talked about, you know, it, it, BP or BT use less ports in their environment. They talk about using less cables. And at NetApp, we talk about selling less storage. And our fundamental belief is that you know, we're a storage company. Why would we want to sell less storage? But our fundamental belief is that it's something which makes the environment more efficient will end up driving more applications onto the infrastructure, cause more data to be stored. And in the long run, we think it's better off for the end user as well, as well as better off for the technology leaders. Now, it also talked about uh, multi-tenancy. And one of the things we've found with large customers is that as soon as you build a shared infrastructure that scales out, the first thing they then want to do is divide it up. Because human organizations naturally want to, to aggregate into something smaller than the entire world. But these, this type of division is more of a logical division of the infrastructure. So you gain all the efficiencies of shared physical infrastructure you can divide it up into virtual networks, virtual servers, and virtual filers uh, in a multi-tenant environment. Uh, and just as you know, screw, screwdrivers don't scale. There's another old line that sharing is a lot easier when everyone has their own stuff. <laughs> this creates the perception. The whole idea of this virtualized infrastructure is to create the perception for the user that they have their own stuff while gaining the cost efficiencies from sharing it physically and being, getting much better use, uh, overall use of that, those assets. But when you create tenants, which are really a group of applications, a group of volumes, a group of network paths, a group of servers, for disaster recovery and availability reasons, you also want to be able to move that set of, of that tenant as an entity. So we have the capability to take that group of, of uh, data sets and non-disruptively move it from one device to another or one node in a cluster to another, thereby assuring continuity of access to the data 
even when the inevitable maintenance windows or upgrade windows or things that may affect the physical infrastructure uh, may threaten an outage. So continuity of availability of data is also a fundamental tenant of large-scale infrastructure. When you have one application on a set of infrastructure, it's, it's possible to find an outage window. When you have 1,000, you'll never find a single a window you can take the entire infrastructure down. It must be an immortal set of infrastructure. <laughs> <coughs> now, Ed mentioned long-distance mobility and the ability to extend the data center architecture over distance as well. We worked together and uh, did a, um, a white paper and a demonstration where we were able to move a running virtual machine 200 kilometers to a different location, taking advantage of NetApp's caching technology to provide access to data at a different location with high performance and basically bridging the, uh, the latency of the long distance, and also taking advantage of Cisco's um, basically Mac on IP, or their OTV technology, to extend the data center environment over distance. The key benefit here is that as workloads move around, often one of the challenges is having to, to re-IP or, or reassign network addresses, because traditional data centers have different IP domains in different locations. This technology starts to bridge that. We have a flatter address space in the network, and it is far easier to move workloads not only within a data center, but between data centers as well. Now, one of our, uh, our collective customers uh, for this technology is T-Systems in Europe. Uh, they're one of the largest IT as a service providers in Europe. It's a division of Deutsche Telekom. And uh, they had a traditional business of hosting uh, IT operations for a number of large accounts. And they started out doing the traditional your mess for less approach of we'll take over your equipment, we'll run it at a, a better price because of our efficiencies. But then they moved and over the past few years have developed and deployed something called AppCom, which is a standardized set of infrastructure built on VMware technology, uh, Ethernet uh, networking, Cisco uh, servers, uh, and NetApp storage, and there's a few other technologies mixed in there, uh, that provides a standard infrastructure upon which they can deploy applications. They're then able to scale this infrastructure extremely large, and they've adopted and supported the enterprise class uh, applications, SAP, Oracle, a range of others for some of the Fortune 50 companies in the world. They've literally have taken over all of the IT for some of the biggest name brands uh, that you've, you've heard of. Uh, and they're able to do it at a cost efficiency roughly 30% less than these companies are running their own IT. This is a real case study of virtualized scalable infrastructure in the large. There's, over, there's thousands of storage devices here. I think they're pushing close to 10,000 servers in this environment. It's an extremely large environment. This is where the, we see the world going with service providers, with large-scale infrastructure in, in IT, but it also is clearly a technology which scales down and is applicable to, to companies of, of any size. So to summarize, NetApp, VMware, and Cisco, we came together about a year ago for the Imagine Virtualize Anything collaboration. We've developed a number of reference architectures to simplify the design and deployment of building blocks for highly scalable, secure, and efficient virtualized infrastructure. These uh, technologies are proven. We have many customers who've deployed uh, these models, and you'll hear a lot more about uh, this technology here at the show. Uh, this is a, a collaboration of three companies who have best-in-class technology in each of their areas. We really share a common vision and a common culture for how to move the industry forward and build a dynamic data center or a dynamic virtual infrastructure. And the, the collaboration between the companies is deep and, and uh, broad within the valley. And this is all about enabling a step-by-step -step transformation, the journey that Vittorio talked about to getting from the inefficient, uh, fairly static and uh, rigid architecture you have today to a more virtualized, more agile, more modern IT infrastructure. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we have <coughs> probably about, <coughs> about 10 minutes for, to take any questions from the audience. <clears throat> any top of mind? There's a microphone in the aisle if anybody wants to uh, Sing. ask us about the PowerPoint remote. I got a question. Yeah. Um, one of the slides, I think it was uh, the Cisco slide, talked about the uh, cooperative support and service. Yep. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? 
Yeah, so um, that's a great question, actually. Um, so there, uh, the challenge when you put solutions from three different companies together is who's willing to take the call if there's a problem. And so the arrangement that we have between our, our technical support organization is that to the extent that you have a deployment of an infrastructure that, that, is, that matches our reference design, um, then any one of the three companies will take the call and work together among the three companies to address the issue. Yeah, I'd echo that. We'll, any company will take the first call, and, uh, and that will, they will own the call with the customer and work in the background with the other two and bring them in as needed. Any other questions? It's no, it's, yeah, no, so there are dedicated people that are focusing on this. Yeah, they'll tap into the broader support organization in each company, but there's a focus of expertise for that. I wanted to mention, if you want to learn more about the journey, the, go to journeytocloud.com. I wrote a lot about the, uh, the customers that I interviewed on that blog. Huh? Thank Any you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Fun.